can't say welcome today, but Shino, you're welcome. Uh, we'd like to thank Congregation Kedra Torah for their wonderful hospitality. Uh, with Fod, Rabbi Baum, I think Rabbi Weil, I think, was here. Um, committee members, everybody who's gathered here on this special Tisha B'Av to see a very special program. The Northern New Jersey Holocaust Memorial and Education Center is a project that we started a number of years ago with the goal to build a permanent memorial to the victims of the Shoah, as well as to establish an education program that will serve the entire region. Some people say, you know, why do we need something in this community, which is such a richly populated Jewish community? Well, one only needs to look at what happened in Tenafly a number of weeks ago to understand that we are not here to preach to the choir. We're here to run educational programs for the entire region, for Jews, non-Jews, public schools, yeshivot, everybody, so that they will understand what happened to the Shoah and, more importantly, the lessons to be learned. So it's a project that today, with the rise of anti-Semitism, is more important than ever before. And I think it's important that the community understands that while it takes a significant investment from the community and it takes a special effort from the Rabbanim in the community, it's something that will hopefully serve the community for many years to come and also be something that will influence people from all over the community to understand what happened and to make sure it doesn't happen again. The proposed memorial is going to be on a campus that's going to be shared by a group from the enslaved that's putting up a memorial to enslaved Africans. And so the synergy of people going from one memorial to the other, people who otherwise would not visit each other, is something that we hope will, will be something very special. So before I, before I go any further, I'd like everybody to look at a video that we've prepared. And this will give you a little more insight of that, what the memorial is all about. In 2016, the Teaneck Town Council approved a site for the Northern New Jersey Holocaust Memorial and Education Center and a memorial to enslaved Africans as part of the Garden to Nurture Human Understanding. Studies have shown that an effective deterrent to anti-Semitism is Holocaust education. And to that end, we have already begun to run programs on our own and in conjunction with the Enslaved African Memorial Committee. Our center will develop a multi-level Holocaust curriculum and bring people together just as we have to memorialize the Tree of Life Synagogue Massacre and the New Zealand Mosque Massacres. The Enslaved African Memorial Committee is proud to partner with the Northern New Jersey Holocaust Memorial and Education Center in establishing a garden to nurture human understanding on the Teaneck Municipal Green. It will serve to educate society to the horrors that both groups have endured and teach the importance of tolerance and dignity for all people. We are going to be using augmented reality which is going to bring to life some of the events of the Holocaust by using the latest in uh, iPads and your own personal cell phones and other devices. By aiming the iPad or your phone at the poster or the timeline on the reading panel, you'll be able to bring up images, videos, documents, and artifacts from the different parts and times of the war. We are forming an artist committee and we are in the process of organizing artists to submit their concepts for the centerpiece of the memorial. It will be a symbol of hope amid the tragedy of the Holocaust, and it will be able to be seen from the road to stimulate discussion and curiosity. My father was born in Vienna, Austria in 1934, and he passed away just a short while ago uh, 
not long after his 85th birthday. His recent passing hammered home to me something which I've spoken about and thought about a lot, I've told students about it, and that is that the number of Holocaust survivors uh, is dwindling. Uh, it won't be long before there's really nobody left who can talk firsthand about their experiences during those terrible years. And it's for that reason that I believe that it's more important now than ever for us to have places where people can go, not only to remember and to memorialize those people who experienced it, but also to learn, to have both a memorial and an educational center where people of all backgrounds, Jews and non-Jews, and especially uh, people from the next generation, our children, grandchildren, and their contemporaries. The story of the Shoah was the narrative of my childhood. My late father, Rabbi Herschel Schachter, Zechrono Levracha, was the first American chaplain to enter into the Buchenwald concentration camp as a soldier. He spoke constantly about what he saw. The most profound influence and experience of my childhood was meeting survivors whose lives he saved. I heard their stories. I saw the numbers on their arms. It is essential that these stories be perpetuated and that the Jewish people in the world never forget what happened during the Holocaust. What a bracha it is that our own community is now getting together to be able to provide such a memorial. We've already had generous support from our local government. Now is the opportunity for we, the community of Northern Jersey, to participate, to shape and define our community through not only this great Holocaust Memorial and Educational Center, but this which is a tribute to our past and that will hopefully shape the future of our community is one of tolerance, of decency, and of coexistence. It is important and vital that this effort should have the support of all Jews and all human beings who care about freedom and who care about human dignity. Today is also very special, you know, um, when I asked Rabbi Schachter to be on this video, uh, which was, I think, two years ago, almost two years ago, I knew two things. I knew that he had a very special story to tell about his father, Allah Shalom, and I knew that he himself was a very special person. He's a senior scholar at Yeshiva University Center for the Jewish Future. University Professor of Jewish History and Jewish Thought and Adjunct Instructor in Jewish Studies. But for all of us in the community, we know him as a Malamed, somebody who is very strong in the modern Orthodox world, a leader like, like his father, Allah Shalom. And so it is my privilege to introduce Rabbi Jacob Jacob Schachter. Rabbi Schachter points out that we do have a second video that was prepared for the book launch by Dr. Medoff and Yeshiva University. So before we go into both the Rabbi Schachter and Dr. Medoff, let's turn your attention to the video screen for a little introduction to the book. The most unforgettable day in my life was April 11, 1945. It was on that day that as a young American Army chaplain. I served with frontline troops across Europe and then precisely on that day came upon the infamous notorious Buchenwald concentration camp. I had heard nothing of Buchenwald until that day. It was only my sad experience to have seen to have participated in the ravages of war, to have seen city, cities laid waste and homes destroyed and human beings crushed. But especially do I consider it a privilege, tragic and grievous though it was, to have come face to face with the stark, bitter, sordid reality of Jewish tragedy. As I mentioned a moment ago, I came upon this hellhole 
called Buchenwald within a matter of hours after the first columns of American tanks rolled through and liberated that dungeon on the face of this earth. I do indeed consider it a privilege, tragic, sad, to have been among those who literally opened the gates of hell, the crematoria. I saw hundreds of human bodies strewn in front of the ovens that were still hot, the smoke still curling upward, waiting waiting to be shoveled into the furnaces. How can any human being ever forget such a sight? I stood there in front of those hot ovens, my eyes riveted to that view. I, I, I must tell you that whenever I even attempt to repeat this story, to relive that moment, it is exceedingly difficult to do so. I ran to seek out Jews, to find Jews who were still alive, and indeed there they were in a long series of low barracks. I ran into one after another, and there again, no matter what we have seen or heard, believe me, there simply are no words in the human vocabulary that can even remotely attempt to describe the horrors, the brutal, inhuman horrors that were perpetrated against our people. Within this huge Buchenwald camp, there was one area that was called Das Kleine Lager, the small camp that was reserved especially for the brutal treatment of Jews. I went into those barracks, and there I saw just raw planks of wood shelves on which were strewn scraggly, stinking straw sacks. And there they were, looking down at me. Men, a few boys. There were no women in Buchenwald. But I will never forget those eyes, haunted with fear, half-crazed, emaciated, more dead than alive. Spontaneously, intuitively, I felt the only language that I could speak that most of them would understand was Yiddish. And I called out, Sholem Aleichem, Yidin, Yils and Frei, you are free, the war is over. And there they were looking out at me through incredulous eyes. But again, I can't continue, I could go on and on, but from that moment I must tell you that my life changed, the impact of that experience was enormous on the whole course of my career. I want to thank Steve Fox very, very much. I want to thank Steve for the incredible work that you are doing with uh, members of your committee and supporters to put together this Holocaust Center and educational center here in our community. Uh, as I uh, said on the uh, video that we heard a moment ago, I think this is really incredibly important. Uh, this work uh, needs to be done, and you have been Moser Nefesh personally in heroic ways in order to make sure that this happens. You have made this your crusade. You have personally, indefatigably pushed and pushed and pushed. And when it happens, and it will happen, it will happen because of you. There are those who help you. Uh, there are those who support you. But it's you. And you teach us, Steve, the impact that one person can make. One person wants to do something good and doesn't let anything stop him. And we could learn what it means to see the impact of one person, and we thank you very much. I also want to thank you for putting together this uh, program and for inviting me and Dr. Medoff to uh, participate. I uh, want to thank also Congregation Ketatora for co-sponsoring together with the Northern New Jersey Holocaust Memorial and Educational Center, and uh, welcome all of you who are here. I'm 
very happy that my wife, Yocheved, is here, our children, Dr. Leah Knapp, Rabbi Jonathan Knapp, and many who uh, knew my father. Um, Rabbi Michael Miller is here, who's a very close family friend, who was very close with my father, and uh, Heshi Saif, I see, who was um, actually a family member, and uh, others who I haven't yet uh, noticed, uh, who are either related to us or interacted somehow, somewhere along the way with, uh, with my father, Zechron Levracha. Uh, so today is Tisha B'Av, and uh, Tisha B'Av is a day that's set aside to commemorate the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, of both Batei HaMikdash. But it's a day to commemorate not just the, the destructions of the Batei HaMikdash, but as Rabbi Soloveitchik pointed out repeatedly, it's a day that we set aside to commemorate all Jewish tragedies. And uh, earlier today in the keynotes that we recited, there's a keynote about the Asura Aruge Malchus, the Ten Martyrs. There's a keynote about the uh, Crusades. There's a keynote about the burning of wagon loads full of uh, rabbinic texts in uh, Paris in the 13th century. There are all kinds of texts uh, commemorating tragedies that have actually nothing to do with the ninth of Av. We know when many of them occurred, we have the dates, and it's not Tisha B'Av. Point being that uh, even though it didn't happen on Tisha B'Av, but Tisha B'Av is a day that we remember them, and we focus on them, and we commemorate them. And if that's the case with regard to all of these, and it's Kalvachomer, certainly the case when it comes to the Shoah. Shoah needs to be memorialized and remembered on Tisha B'Av. There has uh, been a long-standing debate in our community as to when the most appropriate time uh, is to commemorate the Shoah uh, in this uh, congregation and in our community. Uh, we follow the lead of the Israeli Knesset that established uh, the 27th day of Nisan as what is known as Yom HaShoah V'Hagvura, that there is a special, separate, unique day designated in the Jewish calendar to commemorate the Shoah. But even if we do, and there were those who were opposed, Rabbi Soloveitchik, for example, was very opposed to Yom HaShoah, but even those who do commemorate Yom HaShoah, uh, certainly the day of Tisha B'Av is, is uh, equally appropriate. Uh, for Rabbi Soloveitchik, the only day to commemorate the Shoah uh, was on Tisha B'Av. And it certainly, for all of us, is an appropriate day. And so therefore, it makes sense. It makes sense that we gather uh, under the auspices of a forthcoming Holocaust uh, center and educational center. And uh, we gather to, uh, I guess, celebrate and acknowledge the appearance of this uh, book, the cover of which uh, you've all seen. Uh, is a picture of my father in Buchenwald that you saw on the uh, screen as well. This is a day that we should do it, and I'm, I'm very touched uh, that uh, you have come to participate with us uh, in support of this uh, Holocaust Center. Our major gratitude goes to Dr. Raphael Medoff, who honors us as the author of this book. Uh, my sister and I, and my mother, Olea Shalom, uh, embarked on this project about five or six years ago, and we were uh, highly recommended to turn to our, who has now become a very close personal friend, to Dr. Medoff. He had a great reputation, head of the Wyman Center for Holocaust uh, Studies, uh, Holocaust historian, American Jewish historian, uh, from the time we met him till now, he's written another three or four books, but then I think it was only at 18 when we first met one another. And uh, we uh, realized that we were in very good hands. And uh, my mother kept saying, no, 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 when is the book, when is the book? She wanted to see the book. She passed away two years ago and regretfully was unable to see the book. And my sister and I, my sister Miriam and I persevered and uh, we can only say as a family that we are unbelievably and extraordinarily grateful to Dr. Medoff for having produced what we believe is an absolutely exceptional book. Um, he left no stone unturned in the research. 
and uh, put it all together and writes like he is performing a symphony. The, the, read, the book reads magnificently. It's gripping. It's, the content is significant, but in your expert hands, it just flies. Um, we asked Dr. Medoff uh, not to write a hagiography of our father, uh, one of these kind of biographies that talk about how great the person is, and, and certainly he was great, but we wanted it to be an objective assessment, and we even did not want the book to be focused on his biography. What we were looking for, and what Dr. Medoff magnificently produced for us, was a book that sees events in 20th century Jewish life uh, in the United States and in Israel and in the former Soviet Union and across the world through the lens of my father's experiences. My father, in the course of a long life, he passed away at the age of 95, the course of a long life touched many different uh, events, impacted many different events as they unfolded throughout 20th century Jewish life. And the story of his life sheds a lot of interesting insights and attention on a lot of these events. And so Dr. Medoff not only totally internalized all the details of uh, our father's life, but he did research on all of these events. And each one of them is a chapter, all of these events. Uh, he even did research on the fights that happened in shuls in Manchester, New Hampshire, when Maizaida came. My father's father, Maizaida, came to the United States in 1907. I think you'll correct me no better than I. And he became a sheikhet. Our name is Shechter. And Maizaida was the seventh generation sheikhter. Ben Achar Ben, seven generations. My father broke the mold. So I guess it made it easier for me not to feel guilty that I'm not a sheikhet. My father already was not a sheikhet. He broke the mold. But my Zayda was a sheikhet, the last of seven generations. Pinchas ben Reb Shmuel Hersh moved to Manchester. My father told me that he got a nickel for every gasa, every behemoth, and he got a penny for every chicken that he shechted in Manchester. And lo and behold, Dr. Meroff discovers there are two shuls in Manchester in 1908. There's the shul I go to and the shul that I don't go to. And he figured out, like, what was going on in this shul and that shul. And he figured out all of it. Everything that my father touched, every position that he held in the American and international Jewish community, every interaction that he had with world leaders, every trip that he took that mattered, he was able to provide a context for. And that's what we were looking for. We wanted the American Jewish experience and the Israeli experience of the 20th century to be enlightened via this book. And uh, it's not only the story of his life, which obviously as children and uh, my mother as, uh, as a wife and, uh, and my, my sister and our spouses and our children and our grandchildren, uh, that's obviously very important. Uh, but also to see it as a major contribution to, to Jewish history, and, and for that we're very grateful. It was very difficult uh, for me to grow up in this household. Um, my father was a larger-than-life figure, uh, very uh, powerful, uh, very strong, and uh, had a legacy of uh, tremendous uh, impact on the world. And uh, we grew up, my sister and I grew up, in this house of someone who was internationally renowned and who made a real big difference in so many different ways. And I'll speak for myself, it was uh, a struggle to try to figure out uh, in this space, what, what am I going to do? You know, I, I'm not going to save lives. I'm not going to go into a concentration camp and, and, and help people uh, return their dignity to them. What, what can I ever possibly do? And uh, it, was, it was a lot of work to try to find a space for myself in this, in this great uh, uh, area that was uh, occupied with extraordinary distinction uh, by my father. But what, uh, what inspired me was a story that happened, and I've told this story before, but I think it's, it really is very emblematic of uh, the impact that uh, my father had on me and 
were my sister here, she would speak for herself, but I think she would agree. And I'll prove it to you in a moment. Um, when I was about five or six years old, um, it was uh, 1956, and uh, my father disappeared for about seven weeks to go to the former Soviet Union. Uh, one of the stories, um, I guess, that Dr. Medoff will, will uh, touch on this at some point is uh, his visit to the FSU, former Soviet Union, in the first delegation of uh, American rabbis who were allowed into the Soviet Union after the Russian Revolution of 1917. And uh, it's, a, it's a very dramatic story. It's a whole chapter in the book devoted to it. Uh, but I was a Pisher Yingle kid. I was uh, five years old, six years old. All I knew is that Tati was gone. We only spoke Yiddish in our house until I was five years old, four years old. Can ein Wort English aber Gunish verstanden? Mamish can ein Wort. I'd walk in the street, say, Mami, wo se dos, wo se dos, wo se dos, du, wo se dos, the Schutzmann, wo se I had to go to first grade in the Lubavitch Yeshiva in the Bronx, to learn English. So I learned English when I was in first grade. Till then, can Wort English aber Gunish verstanden? I called my mother Mami, my Tati was Tati. So I tell my mother, all of a sudden it dawned upon me at some point that he, we were in the bungalow colony, and I'm, uh, my sister and me and my mother, and I said, Mommy, V is Tati. Take your time. Wait. Just tell me when you're done, and I'll continue. We're good? So I said to Mommy, Mommy, V is Tati. So my Mommy answered, Tati is gegangen health from Yid. Tati is gegangen helfen Yidin. Tati went to help Jews. And I don't know exactly why, but somehow, okay, I got it now. I don't know what that meant when I was five or six years old. But that was the mantra for us. Uh, Tati wasn't home a lot, but Tati is gegangen uh, helfen Yidin. And that was so profoundly important for us that on his matseva, at the bottom of his matseva, we inscribe for eternity, Eres Gegang in Hell from Eden. Those words appear on his tombstone. Uh, so that's the proof that my sister and I both agreed that this was really a foundational uh, experience for both of us. And uh, that gave us uh, strength and gave us inspiration to be able to try to do whatever it is that we could do. I want to leave time for, uh, for Dr. Madoff. I want to read to you from two books. So to give you a sense, a little bit of a sense uh, of uh, who our father was, and I want to focus on the Holocaust experience, because it is Tisha B'Av. We're going to hear more about the other experiences uh, shortly. I want to read to you from two books uh, who, uh, which describe the impact of my father in Bochenwald. The first one comes from a very famous book called uh, Out of the Depths. It's an English translation of a book by Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, very prominent. And we uh, asked him if he would write a blurb for the back of Dr. Madoff's book, and he graciously agreed. Uh, he was a little boy. He was uh, six or seven, known as Lulik, uh, in Bochenwald. He and his older brother, Naftali, were in Buchenwald, my father discovered them, and, and my father really helped them a lot. And in this book, he describes the encounter uh, with my father, which is a really fascinating story. And then after they got to know one another, the uh, pistol-toting uh, American uh, soldier chaplain and this little, little, little boy hiding behind a pile of corpses, he writes as follows, Then the American rabbi took me by the hand, and together we made the rounds of the barracks announcing the liberation. We entered some of them together, others he entered alone. I remember the people lying inside with blank stares, without even the strength to get up from their bunks. We saw them just a few minutes ago. These people were not among those who would run to the camp gate and shout hooray with the rest. Jews, you are liberated, called out the American rabbi in Yiddish. Eden is ein frei. When my father died, in, uh, right before Pesach in 2013, his obituary appeared on the front page of the New York Times. He would have been happy that it was on the front page of the New York Times. He would have been less happy that it was below the fold 
on the front page of the New York Times, but Nabnuk was Kementin des Ochetepes, the front page of the New York Times, even though it was below the fold. There was a picture of him, front page, and the, uh, the title of the obituary is Jews, You Are Free, because this is what the mantra, this is what earned him that kind of recognition. And the picture that is on the top, on the cover of Dr. Medoff's book was in the back of page 17 when you got to the inside story of the continuation of the obituary. The inmates gazed at him incredulous as if to ask, who is this crazy Michigana standing here in uniform screaming in Yiddish? After visiting all the bunkers, Rabbi Shaka helped me find Naftali, his older brother. We went to the Buchenwald hospital where my brother was being treated for typhoid fever. My name is Herschel Schachter, he said, introducing himself to Naftali. I'm the armory rabbi for the division that liberated Buchenwald. He took out several cans of orange juice from his bag. I know who you are, I'm going to help you, everything will be all right, he reassured Naftali and concluded with Mazel Tov, congratulations, we have gone. May Avdus Lacherus from slavery to freedom, he said, referring to the story of the Exodus. Naftali names Rabbi Herschel Schachter as the first person to offer him relief after liberation and says that the rabbi restored his confidence in himself and in humanity. His older brother, Naftali, was a consul general in, uh, for the state of Israel in New York. He moved to Israel uh, with his younger brother, Lulek. Lulek became the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, chief rabbi of Israel, now again the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. And, uh, Naftali Lavi became uh, very prominent as a uh, advisor to a number of prime ministers, appointed to be the consul general in New York. This is in the early 80s, and the first thing he did when he came to New York was he paid my parents a visit. That was his first uh, official visit in New York City to express a Satov. The second and concluding uh, quote comes from a book called Measure of a Man. I don't know if you ever heard of him. His name is Martin Greenfield. He's a tailor. And he's like a very hush of a tailor. You know, like, yeah, I'm not holding for some madrega that I should buy like a quarter of a pocket from Martin Greenfield. He's known as the president's tailor. He has made suits for, and he got pictures in here. Can I know her? Pictures with all the presidents, I think, from Truman. He was in Buchenwald. He came to the United States, and he figured out how to be a tailor, and he shot right up to the top, I think, through Clinton. I'm not sure about Bush. I'm not sure exactly, but they're all in here. Obama is in here, picture with him and Obama. He made, and he told me, Greenfield, that what he would do is he would, he cares about the Jewish people, so when he delivered the suit, he slipped into the pocket, be good to the Jews, into the pocket of the Heisen. So when the president puts his hand in the Heisen, he should pull out, he should say, be good to the Jews. So this is the kind of guy he is, Martin Greenfield. He really, really, like a schmack of a guy. Uh, he should have a refor shalem. He published an autobiography, Measure of a Man. Now you understand what the significance of the title is. So he's in Buchenwald, and he... Uh, he uh, attends that service, that uh, the picture, uh, the cover of Dr. Madoff's book is from a service, uh, davening that my father ran in Buchenwald. On April 20th, 1945, Rabbi Herschel Schachter conducted the first Friday night Shabbos service. There was singing, reciting of blessings, prayer, and much weeping. It was moving, yet all through the service, the question I could not escape on the night of my death march haunted me. The next day, Rabbi Shatter was mulling about outside the Czech barracks. In Yiddish, he said, Is there a Jew around here who can speak Yiddish? Yes, can. I can, I said in Yiddish. Ah, where are the Jews around here? This is the Czech barracks, I told him. I'm one of the few Jews here. They let me stay here because I'm from Czechoslovakia. I see, he said. Rabbi, I attended your service last night. It was very beautiful. But may I please ask you a question? Of course, he said. Rabbi, I must know. Where was God? He stood still and silent. Look what happened, I pleaded. Where was God? Where? There are no answers to certain questions, he said, staring off in the distance. That is a question for which there is no answer. I lowered my head and I cried. Rabbi Schachter wrapped his arms around me and he held me. There's a postscript to this story. 
1985, uh, some of you may remember, the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington was uh, first built. And there was a program, a uh, memorial program, a groundbreaking program for this uh, memorial museum. My father was invited as one of the uh, primary speakers. And uh, Martin Greenfield was invited as a hush of a donor to come to this event. And he comes to the groundbreaking of the US uh, Holocaust Museum. And he describes a little bit about what it's like. And then he says as follows. During the ceremony, an old rabbi got up to make some remarks. I told Marty, I said, Marty, it was very nice, but you didn't have to call him an old rabbi. He wasn't, he wasn't that old yet at that time. During the ceremony, an old rabbi got up to make some remarks. His face looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. So that's 1945, and now it's 1985. I know that rabbi from somewhere, I whispered to Arlene, his wife. The rabbi continued speaking. He explained that he had witnessed the Nazi atrocities of the Holocaust firsthand as a chaplain in the US Third Army, which liberated Buchenwald. No way, I thought, can't be him. And then as if God himself were winking down at me, the rabbi told the story I knew well. After the liberation, he recounted a young boy and asked him a question he could not answer. Where was God? It's him, I said excitedly to Arlene. After the ceremony, I found the rabbi. Rabbi Schachter, my name is Martin Greenfield. I was in Buchenwald. I was a little boy. Who asked you that question? Rabbi Schachter told me he lived in the Bronx. We stayed in touch until his death in 2013. Every time we visited, no matter the occasion, we relived the story together. But standing there at the Holocaust Museum dedication, which had turned into a Buchenwald reunion, with tears streaming down our faces, all we could do was hold on to each other. I didn't want to let go of him, and he didn't want to let go either. Final sentence, to experience once again that connection, to stand with the man who held me as a boy when my spirit had been shattered by the Nazis and their lust for death and darkness, I felt as though I'd been kissed by an angel. That's a legacy. That's a legacy to leave that kind of an impact. And our family is blessed that he was our father and husband and grandfather and great-grandfather. And I think the Jewish world was blessed by having someone who was such an advocate uh, to try to help Jews wherever they are because, as we inscribed in his matzeva, Tati is gigangen. Health from Eden. Thank you for coming. Dr. Raphael Medoff is the founding director of the David Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies based in Washington, which focuses on America's response to Nazism and the Holocaust. He's the author of more than 20 books about the Holocaust, Zionism, and American Jewish history. He was obviously preeminently qualified to write this special book, and we are privileged to have him here with us today. Dr. Medoff. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to Rabbi J.J. Schachter and Miriam Schachter for their support and initiative in making uh, the biography of their father possible. Um, it was an honor for me to write the book, but I have to say that I did not realize what an honor it would be when I began, because I did not have the good fortune to ever meet Rabbi Schachter in person. I was able to interview Penina <coughs> Rebetzin Schachter um, and the children, other members of the family, but I did not have um, the bracha of being able to have met Rabbi Schachter himself in person. And that was one of the challenges, of course, of writing a book like this. Uh, but before I begin, I want to also um, express my special thanks to Steve Fox and uh, everyone involved in the Northern New Jersey Holocaust Memorial Project, and to Rabbi Baum and Congregation Keter Torah for hosting this event. 
I have no doubt that Rabbi Herschel Schachter would have been a very strong supporter of the Northern New Jersey Holocaust Memorial Project, as am I. And I say that because he was, among many other things in his life, he was the first chairman of the um, Yom HaShoah Holocaust Commemoration Committee of the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York. And uh, I was very pleased um, to see Rabbi Michael Miller, longtime executive director of the JCRC, here with us today. In 1976, when the JCRC created that Holocaust Commemoration Committee, it was something rather novel in the American Jewish world. Today we are used to, we are blessed with, Holocaust Memorial initiatives here and throughout the country. Um, but that was not the case in the 1970s. And in fact, Rabbi Schachter spoke in some of his post-war interviews about the fact that during the 1950s and 1960s, he was virtually never given an opportunity or invited to speak about his experiences in Buchenwald, which is remarkable when we think about what, what he went through there and what he could have told. We've seen here just a very brief glimpse and a very brief uh, audio of Rabbi Schachter's recollections of those initial moments in Buchenwald. But um, for many years, the Holocaust was not a major topic of uh, the American Jewish community, and I won't go into the reasons for that. It's an interesting and separate subject, uh, but suffice to say that it was not until after the Six-Day War in 1967, and partially connected to that, that the whole subject of Holocaust commemoration became a matter of serious interest to the American Jewish community. And it was at that point that um, endeavors such as the JCRC's Holocaust Commemoration Committee began, and there was surely no more appropriate person to head that committee than someone who could speak as, a, as an eyewitness to uh, the horrors of the Holocaust from his experiences in Buchenwald. Can I have the first uh, slide, please? Now, because it is Tisha B'Av, I want to share some reflections that are not exactly what you'll read in the book, but are, of course, connected to it but specifically about the themes of disunity and unity in the Jewish world, precisely because um, when we speak about the history and the lessons and the meaning of Tisha B'Av, we, all, we often reflect on the terrible Jewish disunity that contributed to the, the destruction of the, um, the two Bati Mikdash. And then, as you know, as, as we begin to draw toward the close of Tisha B'Av, we begin to reflect on more hopeful themes going forward towards the future and the ever-elusive goal of Jewish unity. I want to suggest to you that these themes of unity and disunity uh, form an important part of Rabbi Herschel Schachter's experiences and help us understand the man and the era. Non-Orthodox American Jewish leaders looked at their Orthodox colleagues as representatives of a movement that was not going to be a serious force in the Jewish world. In those days, the 50s, the 60s, most non-Orthodox Jews and most prominent Jewish sociologists expected that Orthodoxy was, uh, would not survive on the American scene. That, that, that Jewish religious observance could not withstand the pressures of suburbanization and assimilation and of, of, of all the things that, that go on in American society that militate against um, Jewish religious observance. That was the expectation. That was the prediction. Nobody could have imagined. Nobody did. Nobody predicted that orthodoxy could undergo the resurgence that it has. And that someone like Herschel Schachter could be more than just the president of some orthodox organization, but could actually be the spokesman for the entire American Jewish community, and arguably one of the most effective leaders of the Conference of Presidents and of American Jewry. So now to conclude with um, a few words about, a few final words about disunity and unity. I began with a scene from Rabbi Schachter's years as a chaplain. 
the chaplaincy in some ways, Jewish chaplain, the subject of Jewish chaplaincy symbolizes both this problem of unity and disunity in the Jewish world over the decades. In order for a young rabbi to become a chaplain in World War II, here's how it worked. He would apply to what was known as the, and still is, the Jewish Welfare Board. Jewish Welfare Board had a chaplaincy commission. The chaplaincy commission had honored representatives of the Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform movements. Herschel Schachter applied through the Orthodox representatives on the chaplaincy commission. They would then recommend his nomination, and the others, the Reform Conservative delegates of the commission, would all approve. And this system worked well for many years, and it was, it was very much a symbol of Jewish communal cooperation, even at a time when there were strains and arguments in other areas of the, Jewish, of the organized Jewish community, the chaplaincy stood out as one area where Orthodox, conservative, reform leaders, rabbis sat together toward a common goal. They all wanted ch Jewish chaplains in the army because they all knew of the need for Jewish GIs to have someone who was looking after them, someone who would cons console them, counsel them, inspire them. So in pursuit of this great common goal, you had an ex this extraordinary initiative of cooperation. And it lasted many, many years beyond, beyond times when other parts of the organized community began to splinter apart in the face of different political and theological divisions. As the reform and conservative movements moved one way and the fissures between orthodoxy and the other movements grew wider, cooperation began to deteriorate. The chaplaincy still stood as one area in which unity still was achieved until, until finally in 1986, the reform delegates on the chaplaincy commission announced that they were nominating a woman rabbi to be a chaplain. This was something that was just too much for Herschel Schachter and his Orthodox colleagues on the commission to, um, to handle. When I say Herschel Schachter, so after the war, naturally after Schachter's experiences as a chaplain, he was then made a member of the chaplaincy commission and he served as one of these Orthodox delegates who would approve the nominations of future candidates. The idea of a woman rabbi in those days, a woman is a woman reform rabbi, was so unsettling that they could not agree and so for a brief moment, it appeared that the chaplaincy commission was going to be torn apart. Because as I say, the working procedure was that all of the delegates of the commission all had to approve all of the nominations, and they always did. But this one time, Herschel Schachter and his colleagues felt they could not do it. And from the newspaper clippings that I uncovered about this episode, it appeared that that was the end of the chaplaincy commission. I was very, I have to say I was personally saddened to see that this great experience of Jewish unity had finally, like so many others, had crumbled under the weight of different disagreements. But a historian should never stop at the newspaper clippings. You, should dig, you need to dig as far as this is what they taught us in grad school. Keep digging, keep digging. Um, the rabbis who were actually involved in that episode um, in 1986, were no longer around, but the daughter, herself a, a reform rabbi, the daughter of the reform, the chief reform delegate to the commission, was still, is, is still, you know, active. And I tracked her down, and she had a very welcome surprise for me. She said, well, I remember the story well. She was a college student at the time, so she had a clear memory of it from her you know, 20s. And she had kind of lived it because she remembered her father dealing with this crisis when her father was proposing a woman chaplain and Herschel Schachter and the other Orthodox delegates were saying, no, we can't accept it. And it appeared that the commission had dissolved. That's what the newspapers reported. She said, here's what actually happened. She said, behind the scenes, Rabbi Schachter and my father reached an unwritten agreement. And the agreement was the Orthodox 
delegates would now only approve the Orthodox nominees. And the conservative rabbis will approve the conservative nominees. The reform will approve their nominees. And okay, the army is going to have to deal with three sets of rabbis. And they would prefer if it was just one, one set of nominations. But the army was not complaining. And she said, and this was a way, this was the way that in practice they preserved Jewish unity in the world of the chaplaincy, by not dissolving, by not everybody throwing up their hands in anguish and going home, but rather by quietly finding a practical way to cooperate so that the very important work of chaplaincy, something that Herschel Schachter deeply appreciated from a lifetime of experience, and especially from the experiences of Buchenwald that forged his professional life, something that he particularly appreciated. Because if you think about it, in Buchenwald, Rabbi Herschel Schachter saw firsthand that in times of crisis, when Jews are persecuted, no distinctions are made between orthodox and conservative and reform, between observant and non-observant, between politically conservative and politically liberal. That kind of unity is not the kind of unity we want, but that's the reality. And he, he, he saw that firsthand, and he came to appreciate and strive for and dedicate the rest of his life for looking for ways, whether in the Soviet Jewry struggle or for Israel or within the chaplaincy, to advance that elusive, precious goal of unity that we begin to think about now as the closing moments of Tisha B'Av conclude. Thank you, and I think we have time for some questions. And Rabbi J.J. Shaffer, do you want me here? Questions? Yes, ma'am. Really not. Thank you both for making us feel like we got to know Rabbi Schachter. Uh, but how do we take his message, the unity, and looking for ways to unite all streams today when we just had a rally where everybody's writing notes and letters and articles, how terrible. There is, of course, no simple answer. But I would say, first of all, let's not lose heart at the fact that only a few thousand people attended the rally against anti-Semitism in Washington, D.C. There are a lot of factors that explain why some rally, rallies attract larger or smaller audiences. So I would, not, um, I, would, I would not look to that as a sign um, that people don't care or that... Um, or that we're losing hope. You can look at it another way, and I would like to think Herschel Schachter would have looked at it this way. Look at it as a start. I'm sure there will be more rallies, and I imagine that they will be larger and have even more of an impact. But um, I think that perhaps that's the, speaking in the broadest terms, maybe that's the ultimate lesson, is don't lose heart. Um, look to the examples that Rabbi Schachter set and that the American Jewish community set in those great years of unity, unity in support of Israel, unity for Soviet Jewry. Look to those, those periods in, in recent American Jewish history as exemplars, as role models for what we, have, what we should aspire to and let us keep aspiring to and never let our hands grow tired. Um, and that ultimately, I suppose, is the way we will, um, we will triumph as a community by persisting. Yes.
finding a, a path for yourself or a place for yourself among will be in that environment or with that backdrop. If I knew you were and I knew you better, then I think we could have a more personal conversation. You could tell me about your growing up and about whatever it is that's why you asked that particular question, halacha lemaisa. First, I want to respond to Mindy, uh, previous question, I'll, I'll come to you. So, so Mindy, uh, you know, my father's gone and now you're, you're up, you're it. Tag Mindy, you're it. So here's the thing, here's the thing. I want to follow up on Dr. Medoff, and that is that if we can internalize that in fact unity is a value, then we'll have to figure out a way how to make it happen. And you're now up, and uh, we're in good hands with you, and you're going to help us figure this out. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how I, to come back to your question, how I, I did it. I, I try to intimate that the notion of Vers Gegang and Health from Eden really mattered. And for some reason, I, I drank that particular Kool-Aid and uh, try to do my way. You know, I, I consciously made a number of significant decisions in my own life that would lead me in a different direction uh, in terms of public service than my father made, precisely for that reason. Um, and, uh, you know, jury's still out. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I did a little good, but not as much good as he did. Yes, it's me. Yeah. Yeah. Having, thank God, Baruch Hashem, interacted with your father, the uh, Kohen Bracha. And uh, first, I just wanted, before I asked, I, I, I asked a question, um, uh, I interacted with uh, Rabbi Shachter at the University, University, and also I interacted with Rabbi Shachter in the student struggle for Soviet Jewry. And I have to say one thing um, at Shiv University, he was amazing with the students, he really was. One-on-one, -on -one, I had a lot of personal discussions with him, and you know he really was sensitive and caring, and really, really, really cared, and gave incredible direction to the students. Uh, and in students of the Soviet jury, those days were not so simple, because there was a lot of friction between different elements of the of the Soviet jury movement, the students of the Soviet jury, which I was part of, JDL, which I had some very good connections in. And you know, and the National Conference Soviet jury, the you know, they didn't necessarily agree. And I remember very, very vividly that your father, Stefan Bracha, was very. We had a lot of discussions with him, and he really strong man made his comment and made it straight. But it was always about giving some clarity that you know you have to work things out. And, and you know, he gave us some very good direction. And as you see, eventually. Everybody participated in, in the freeing of the Jews of the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, and Rabbi Shachter was very, very involved. Not a question, because I made a comment that we were supposed to ask questions. And um, your father was a very strong personality, very, very strong. And um, I remember his, when he got up and spoke, and his, you know, his very strong and booming statements. And how did that, um, how was that, your, in your life and in your sister's life, how did that impact your life as far as how you interact with people? I know it's, it's uh, you know, having a strong, a parent with a strong personality, you know, is not simple. So the question, and I had parents with strong personalities, how did that impact your life and impact your life as, as, a, as a rabbi who's been very successful? Thank you very much. Um, it, uh, I, I, learned, I learned a lot from my father, and uh, the parts of uh, his uh, life that were harder for me, I tried to do differently. And uh, that basically, in a nutshell, is the answer to the question. Um, I feel blessed that I had such an incredible father. Um, and uh, I think as time goes on, I feel more blessed uh, because the... Uh, the distance uh, of those years when I did feel his incredible overarching uh, character and personality in my life have dissipated uh, to some extent. Um, but I've uh, tried to do the best I could and uh, learned a lot from him. The rest I'll tell you privately. <laughs>
Before we conclude, I just wanted to briefly mention one other, um, one other thing. Rabbi Schachter had a, um, an assistant who I did not really know about um, until I got into the research for this book. Hyman Shulman was a young um, American Jewish GI, and um, I'm, I'm very pleased that um, his, um, his son and several other members of the Shulman family are here with us today. And he found himself, and I guess you were to say by chance, um, assigned to be Rabbi Schachter's driver. So when we saw that in the, the video clip, you saw the, the Jeep that said Chaplin on the front. So Hyman Shulman was the driver and Rabbi Schachter was next to him. And they, when they went into Buchenwald, they went in together. And not just in Buchenwald, but as you'll see in the book, they also went around the countryside um, assisting other Jews who had been, who'd been liberated from various slave labor factories and other, other places. Um, and Hyman Shulman was a terrific correspondent. He wrote a treasure trove of letters back to his wife. And the, the Shulman family was very gracious in allowing me to, um, to look at the letters which pertain to Rabbi Schachter, and they helped um, shed some important additional light on Rabbi Schachter's activity. So I just wanted to add that um, expression of gratitude to the family. Um, and the, the letters, incidentally, were the subject of a major article in the New York Times a few years ago, because to have an American Jewish GI's eyewitness descriptions of Buchenwald and everything else is something of a rarity for historians, and, um, and hopefully those letters will eventually be published um, in, a, in a significant volume, and we'll all be able to benefit from that. But I just wanted to thank you for that contribution to this work. I wanted to thank uh, Rabbi Schachter, Dr. Medoff, Everybody who came here, everybody who's watched on Zoom, uh, we will be posting the program on our website, nnjholocaustmemorial.org. There will also be additional uh, opportunities for people to donate to the project and to stay tuned for other things that we do. I want to wish you all at Somkal, and we should all be matzliach. This book took, I understand, six years to put together. Our project is also taking a number of years, but I hope that we are as matzliach as Dr. Menoff and Rabbi Schachter are with this book, with our uh, uh, Holocaust Memorial. Have a tzom call. Thank you. Thank you. There are some books outside that can be autographed for those who donated or those who didn't buy it. Can be welcome to do it too. Thank you.